Now, uh, leaving aside dependencies, we are coming to a, another type of optimization, right? Which we call loop unrolling. Okay, this is once again something which comes up in the context of high level synthesis. It will be used extensively over there. So it makes sense to sort of understand what it is and how it is useful. Okay. And one of the things is that it is related to the idea of graph unfolding. Okay. So we already went through this business of graph unfolding, right? We had this thing where essentially, let's say that I had uh, something of this sort and I said, if I do 2x unfolding, then I would have something like a0 to b0 and uh, a1 to b1, right? So this is the 2x unfolded version of this graph and so on, right? If you think about what happens in a loop unrolling, it is very similar when you have sort of complex interdependencies between the functional objects inside the loop, okay? But the reason why loop unrolling works is a much more sort of uh, simple thing. It is related directly to the way loops actually get implemented. Okay, So if I look at the assembly language that would get generated for something like this, it would be something like, you know, let's say R1 gets the value zero, some register, right? Initialize the loop. Okay. And also I would probably have some equal to zero, initialize some. Now over here, what I would do is sum equal to sum plus 10, R1 equal to R1 plus 1, branch to loop, if or rather, you know, it would be a bit more in terms of assembly language, it would be like even more uh, broken down over here. What you would end up getting would be something like compare R1 to 100, okay? and branch less than or equal, uh, well, less than, branch less than to loop, okay? That is branch to loop if R1 is less than 100, okay? This is precisely what the code would translate into. Now, this part of it right up here is essentially what we would call the preamble. Right, it is the setup of the code. And this, on the other hand, is what we call the loop body. Okay, over here, what I would have is this would be the preamble. And this combination is effectively the loop body, right? Where essentially it looks as though the sum plus equal to 10 is the only thing that's really being done, right? Whereas when you look at it in terms of assembly language, this basically means that you know, this is the useful work. This is overhead. Why do I call it overhead? Because there are three instructions that are essentially related to just computing whether or not to continue in the loop. Okay. So you can see that the useful work is like one fourth of the total loop body. Okay. Question is, what can I do about it? Right. What if I rewrite my code? to do something like this, okay? Now what will happen is, right, once again, my code would probably look something of this sort, right? R1 equal to zero, sum equal to zero. And now I would have a loop over here where I would do sum equal to sum plus 10, Right? I do this five times. Okay. And then I do R1 equal to R1 plus 1. Compare R1 to 100 and branch less than to loop. Okay. So this is basically three instructions. So you see what has happened because of the fact that I unrolled in this way. The useful work, right, is now five instructions and overhead is three. Okay. So from what I had over here, which was 
1 by 4 is the useful work. What I have over here is 5 by 8 is the useful work. Right? So clearly, this is a very sort of simple example to indicate why loop unrolling could be useful. Okay. Now, what's the drawback? The code has increased. Right? The total number of assembly language instructions or the amount of machine code instructions that I have is going to go up by a significant amount in this case. Okay. Now, in the context of hardware design, right, we are usually more interested in parallelism. Right? And in fact, one thing that we can do over there is to basically pretty much just say, I can do something of this sort, which is to say that, you know, I have a of i equal to b of i plus 10. Now, what happens over there, every time I need to read a b of i from somewhere, which means that some kind of an array indexing, array addressing needs to happen. Okay. I need to add 10, which means I need an ALU type operation uh, unit available to me. And I need to assign a value to a of i, which means once again, it's going to be some data store, once again, writing into memory. Okay. What happens if I unroll as shown over here, right? So this is unrolled by a factor of two, right? In order to make this work or for it to be useful, I need to be able to read both of these in parallel, right? And also write both of these in parallel. And of course, I also need to be able to do two adds in parallel, right? If I cannot do all of these things, there is probably not much point in unrolling. Of course, you know, now I'm talking about a hardware implementation, right? What I had described earlier was a pure software implementation where, you know, I still have the loop overhead and I would be able to eliminate that. Now that loop overhead would still go away in this case. Right. So from a pure software point of view, it is probably still useful to do something like this. But what I'm talking about is how does this get implemented in hardware? And the answer to that is a for loop in general will become some kind of a finite state machine, right? With like multiple different operations happening and so on. Right. So from that point of view, the unrolling will be more useful from the point of view that it is actually cutting down the number of cycles in the that the finite state machine has to spend. Okay. But when can it do that? Only if there are sufficient hardware resources that I can actually get the data that I want. Okay, which is why you'll you can you know readily imagine that if I tried unrolling this, let's say by a factor of uh, three or four or something of that sort, unless I'm able to read that many values at the same time, I might I can't really make use of it. So if n is odd, should there be another check before the second instruction? There are two ways of handling it, right? One is of course the correct way which is to say that, you know, what, what if n was equal to 25, right? Then the last one, a of uh, whatever, I'll basically have, you know, uh, I'll be going in steps of two. So at some point I'll have uh, 22, 23 will be done. And then I'll have i equal to 24. So a of i equal to b, uh, a of 24 equal to b of 24 plus 10, correct, that needs to be done. But then I'll also try to do a of 25 equal to b of 25 plus 10, which is not required and more importantly might actually be wrong because I'm going to be accessing memory which is outside my array bound. Okay, so strictly speaking, there should be another check before the second instruction. What does that mean? Most likely, if I put another check before the second instruction, I will lose all the benefits that I, you know, uh, looked for earlier, right? Which is to say that now I have added extra instructions. I've also added extra logic to, to check whether there, this needs to be done or not which is very likely going to end up meaning that the benefit that I get from the unrolling is lost. Okay. In which case there is another way of doing it, which is what if I had this for i equal to zero, i less than 25, i plus plus, right? a of i equal to b of i plus 10. And I want to unroll by two. Right? I can do it in two ways. Either I can do for i equal to 0, 
i less than 25 i plus equal to 2 ai equal to bi plus 10 and the second one becomes if i less than 25 uh, a or uh, if i plus 1 less than 25 ai plus 1 equal to bi plus 1 plus 10 okay now this is basically what i would call the inefficient way of doing it because of the overhead of the if condition over here another way of doing it right which avoids this is to say for i equal to 0 i less than 24 i plus plus right a of i equals a of i plus 1 equals and then outside the loop i do a of 24 equal to b of 24 plus 10 okay so what this does is eliminate the if check but add extra code okay so it solves the problem by basically adding an extra piece of code over there right and uh, yes uh, in fact one of the things that is uh, worth mentioning at this point is that you know uh, how compilers actually apply these optimizations right uh, the, the easiest compiler for you to work with is basically the, uh, the gcc compiler right the GNU c compiler which as long as you have access to a linux machine or in fact even on a windows machine you readily have gcc available to you to play with gcc has many different optimization levels when you write c code right the typical i mean you know you can give minus o zero which is basically no optimizations then minus o one minus o two minus o three which is increasing levels of optimizations and in fact if you look closely through the documentation it also tells you what kind of optimizations are done in each case okay now there are certain kinds of optimizations especially at the minus o3 level where the compiler actually makes certain assumptions on your code and your data right in fact it will do some things like it most likely you know will not go to the extent of assuming that n is always even for example when you're trying to unroll by two over here but certain other things such as uh, whether the data is properly aligned in memory right whether it is aligned as a multiple of four bytes or something of that sort, or in some cases, even whether this kind of loop unrolling can be done in a proper way, it will assume that your loop indices are such that mm -hmm. the value can be unrolled without causing any problems, right? What happens in such a situation is that there is a potential situation where the compiler might be over optimistic, make an assumption that you can do a certain kind of optimization which actually does not hold good for your particular code because there is something which changes at runtime. Okay. So if you look through the documentation, it generally says that especially the minus O3 type of optimization, be careful with it, right? Because it sometimes does very aggressive optimizations, which depending on how your code is written can possibly even lead to runtime errors. It can give you wrong results. Okay. So that is something to keep in mind. I mean, all these optimizations that I have mentioned over here, in general, they are, you know, by looking at it itself, you can say that, yes, functionally, they are fine. They cannot lead to errors, right? Because of the definition itself is such that all it's trying to do is redo the functionality. But there may be situations where you want to do, you know, you want your compiler to be a little bit more aggressive and try to do optimizations even where it may not entirely be valid. Okay. Anyway, so hopefully this explains the idea of unrolling and the two contexts in which it could be used. One is purely in software. The other is when you do hardware synthesis.